In this bonus edition of Bible Explained Verse by Verse, we're going to discuss who is and what is God. What is his identity? First of all, he's male and only male. He's not male and female. He's not female. By that, I don't mean that he has any kind of sexual organs and he doesn't procreate, but he is spiritually male. Males on earth remind us of the Godhead, but they aren't God, of course. They're just as human as females. The reason God gave us procreation and sexual organs is so that we can multiply. He wants us to multiply because he loves people and he wants as many people in heaven as possible. It was always God's plan for every single human being to go to heaven. He made hell for demons, not for humans. But many humans have already gone there, but it has been their own choice because they rejected God. But God has always wanted everybody to go to heaven. So the most evil person who you can think of today, God wants that person in heaven. And the most evil people who've already gone to hell, God was disappointed when they went to hell. He never planned that for anyone. So God wants lots of people, and he wants lots of people in heaven. God hates it when we die in our sin, because we're not going to be with him forever in heaven. And marriage and family life are a living word picture of God's relationship with us and his relationship with his own son. First of all, God is male. Male means one, and female means many. So there's nothing wrong with being a female. I'm a female, and that's good. God created females and he loves females, but he himself is not female because he is one. And that's why Deuteronomy says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And throughout the whole Bible, it tells us that God is one. Now, you also are one person, but you're not one because you're not one of a kind. There's billions of people, so you're not singular in that sense because there's billions of people who are similar to you. But God is singular. He's a one and only, one of a kind. Nobody else is like him. And that's why we are many. So Jesus has a bride. His bride is the church, and the bride is female. So all people are female, spiritually speaking, in relation to God. Mankind is female, spiritually. Now, Within mankind, we have two different genders, male and female, for marriage and for procreation. But from a spiritual perspective, all human beings are female in relation to God because there's many of us and there's only one of him. When you look at a man and a woman, the woman represents many and the man represents one. From the woman comes many other people because she can give birth and all the children come out of her body, not the man's body. In that sense, she represents many. Now, when you look in the Bible, you see in the book of Revelation is really good examples. There is the harlot who sits on the dragon, and she represents many people who are practicing idolatry, which means they're worshiping demon gods, and they are the apostate church. Those are people who call themselves Christians, but really they serve Satan. They don't serve Jesus. That is the apostate church. That is the woman, the evil woman in the book of Revelation. She represents many. She doesn't represent one person. In Revelation, there is also the woman in the sky who has 12 stars around her head, which represent a crown that represents the 12 tribes of Israel. And she gives birth. The 12 tribes from them came Christ. Jesus uh, was a member of the tribe of Judah. That's the birth that it's talking about. From out of the twelve tribes came Christ himself on earth. And she represents many. She represents all of Israel, all the people in Israel. Also, in the Old Testament, God called Israel, the millions and millions of Israelites, he called them his adulterous wife because they were worshiping other gods. And he actually said a couple of times in the Old Testament that he divorced them. He broke off with them a couple of times because of their great sin. And we'll be coming to those Bible verses soon when we go further in the Old Testament. So again, there's the male-female thing. Whenever the Bible talks about female, it means many. Whenever it talks about male, it means one. 
and God is one. He's only male. He doesn't procreate. He doesn't have sexual organs, but he is spiritually male. He's not male and female. God is also a father, and that's why he gave us fatherhood here on earth. You know, men can all be fathers because God is our father, and that represents to us the heavenly father. And this is why a lot of people don't trust God, because their earthly father wasn't trustworthy. Their earthly father didn't take care of them, didn't nurture them, didn't help them in any way. So it's hard for them to see God as being loving, nurturing, kind, and helpful, because their earthly father was either absent or abusive in a lot of cases. So this has warped people's view of God, and it's made people elevate the mother in their lives, because a lot of people only had a mother. Whatever her problems were, she was the only parent that a lot of people had because of the breakdown of the family. So people have started to elevate the woman, but anyway, that's a whole nother subject. But God is our loving, kind, and gracious, and merciful father, not our mother. He'll never be our mother. He's our father. God doesn't love men more. They're just a word picture for God. They remind us of God in that sense, that we know that he's male. We know that he's our father. Now, in ancient times, and the only reason it isn't this way today is because our society is so warped today. But in ancient times, a man's right hand was always his son. And God's right hand is his son, Jesus Christ. Also, in ancient times, a man and his son are one. They're the same. Whatever the son does, he does for his father. Because in ancient times, the son worked for the father. He was his father's chief servant and chief officer. If you met a son in the marketplace, especially a firstborn son, and you had any kind of business dealings with him, it was the exact same thing as dealing with his father because his son was in his father's place and had the authority of his father. And this gets back to the oneness of God. Jesus works for the father. Everything Jesus does is exactly what the father wants. And furthermore, you and I are not one in the sense that we are not unified within ourselves. When my body wants to sleep, my soul wants to listen to music, and my spirit wants to pray. My body, soul, and spirit don't agree, so my person is in constant disunity. But the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are in perfect harmony and perfect unity. They agree at all times. They're working together at all times. The Spirit never wants anything that the Father doesn't want and that the Son doesn't want. The Son never does anything that the Spirit and the Father don't want. So that's the other reason why God is one and you and I are not. God is unified and you and I are not unified within ourselves. So God is male, God is our father, and God has a son. Now in Proverbs chapter 30 verse 4, it actually says that God has a son. And that's the Old Testament hundreds of years before Jesus was born that verse was written, that God has a son. You can look it up, Proverbs 30, verse 4. It says that God has a son. So even in the Old Testament, they understood that God has a son. In the book of Isaiah and in the book of Psalms, there are numerous references to Jesus Christ being the Son of God and dying on the cross. Now, it doesn't mention him by name as Jesus, but it perfectly describes him. In fact, it describes him on the cross. So I can't wait till we get to Isaiah and Psalms, because you're going to see Jesus on the cross when we get to those books. And that's hundreds of years before Jesus came to earth. So he's a father, he has a son, and God also has a spirit. Now, let's talk about three in one. A lot of people don't like the word Trinity, and that's fine with me, because Trinity is not in the Bible. But the concept of the Trinity is absolutely true. It doesn't matter if you call it the Trinity or not. God is three in one. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Trinity is mentioned in numerous places in the Bible, or should I say, the three parts of God. We first see it in Genesis, where it says that his spirit hovered over the waters. Now that means that God has a spirit. So the Father has a spirit. And then in the book of John, chapter 1 
of the book of John, it says that Jesus is the word of God and he has always existed and he created all things with the Father, which means Jesus was also involved in the creation. And Jesus himself in the New Testament said, before Abraham was, I am. And when Jesus said, I am, he was literally calling himself God, and he was saying that he existed before Abraham. Now, Jesus was born as a human thousands of years after Abraham lived. So for him to say that he existed before Abraham means that he is God. He also said, I am, and I am is the title that God gave Moses at the burning bush. So Jesus literally said he is God. A lot of people don't believe that Jesus claimed to be God, but let me point something important out. Jesus was crucified specifically because he claimed to be God. That was his crime, so-called crime, that he was crucified for. So anybody who says that Jesus never claimed to be God is just flat out lying or they've never read the Bible. Because if you read the New Testament, you will clearly see that the religious leaders crucified Jesus specifically because he claimed to be God. He claimed to be one with the Father. Going back to three and one, how can God be three and one? Well, first of all, God can be anything he wants. And secondly, you and I are also three in one. So if we can be three in one, certainly God can. How can it be that you can be three in one and I can be three in one, but God is not allowed to be three in one? So if you're wondering how you and I are three in one, we each have a body, a soul, and a spirit. Our body is what people can recognize us as physically. So if I'm, you know, several yards away, you can still recognize me by my body. Even if you can't hear my voice, even if I don't tell you my name, if you know me, you'll say, oh, that's Maria, because you can see my body, you can see what it looks like, and you've seen it before, so you know who I am. So you can recognize me by my body. We can recognize God by the word that he speaks and the form that he came in on earth, which is Jesus Christ. Now, you and I also have a soul. That's our personality. And when I write a letter, you cannot hear my voice. But when you read the letter, and you can't see my body either, but when you read the letter, my personality will come out in the writing of the letter. Even if I don't tell you who I am in the letter, if I just start telling you stuff, you'll be, oh, this is from Maria. Because you know me, and you know how I talk, and you know the kind of things I think about, and the kind of things that I say. And when you read the letter, you'll be like, oh, that, that has to be Maria. Okay, so that's my personality. My personality is identifiable. God also has a personality. And this is the characteristics of the Father, which are mentioned in the Old Testament. In one of the last chapters, we just read some of them. He said that he was gracious. He said that he was merciful. He said that he was long-suffering. He has other character qualities too. But all of these are part of his soul, his character, the character of the Father. You and I have a soul, and in our soul, that's where our personality resides. Animals also have souls, and that's why all of your pets have their own individual personalities, because that's what the soul is. That's the personality of any being, of an animal, of human, and of God, and the angels. The angels all have personalities too, and so do the demons. Anybody with a soul has a personality. Now your third part, so you've got a body, you've got a soul, and the third part of you is your spirit. So you are three in one. And believe me, if we're allowed to be three in one, God is allowed to be three in one. And he is. He also has the body form, which is Jesus. He has the character, which is the Father. And he has his own Holy Spirit. It's the only spirit that's holy. My spirit isn't holy. Your spirit isn't holy. But his spirit is perfectly holy, perfectly pure, and without flaw. So the spirit is the part of us that knows right from wrong. And that's why animals don't have a spirit. And that's why they're not created in God's image. Yeah, they have a body. They have a soul. But they don't have a spirit. They don't know right from wrong. They can't pray. They can't talk to God. So they don't have the third component, which is what we have that makes us in God's image. The three things that make us in God's image are the third thing, I should say, that makes us in God's image is our spirit. We know right from wrong. Now, because Jesus is God, he also knows right from wrong. 
That's why when he died on the cross, he died a righteous death. Because you have to know right from wrong and have chosen never to sin in order to be righteous. And that's why the Bible says that Jesus is the righteous one. Jesus is the only one who knew right from wrong but never sinned. That's why the Bible says he is the righteous one. Jesus in me makes me righteous. But I alone by myself, there's no righteousness whatsoever. I have sinned. But basically, the only righteousness that's ever in me is Jesus Christ. And that's what enables me. His spirit in me is what gives me the faith to resist sin. And it's what gives me the perseverance and the character to maintain my faith even when I'm under trial. It's Jesus in me. It's his spirit in me. Basically, that's what God is. He's our father. He's male. He's three in one. He has a son. And his son is part of him. His son is one with him. And it's one of his three parts that make him who he is. He's beautiful and amazing. And there's nobody like God. And because God created us, God has the authority and every right to destroy us. He doesn't want to destroy us. But whatever you create, you have a right to destroy. If you paint a picture and you don't like it, you have every right to throw it in the trash. And no one can say that you don't. If I write a book and I don't like it, I have every right to delete that file from my computer and never think about it again. So what God creates, God also has a right to destroy. So let's not give him cause. Let's love him. Let's live for him. Let's die to ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow him. Because this life is very short and we won't have to suffer very long. All the things that we give up in this life are going to be totally worth it. When we get to heaven, you know what we're, the first thing we're going to do in heaven? We're going to laugh. We're going to laugh so hard. We're going to be so full of joy and we're going to go, man, all those things I gave up on earth, I am so glad, so glad that I gave up those stupid, silly things. I am so glad that I carried my cross and endured a little bit of suffering for a little bit of time so I could be here. Oh boy, is it going to be worth it. You're going to love heaven. It's going to be amazing to finally see our Father face to face, finally have a new body so that we can look at him and not die. That's going to be something. And I hope I'm there and I hope you're there. And anyway, God bless you.